Hello everyone and welcome to ML Done. So today we're going to continue with our talk regarding the artificial neural networks and things are getting a little bit interesting, more interesting and more technical. But first and foremost, let's just remind ourselves as to what we talked about the last time. So the last time we were talking about the biological motivation behind uh, an artificial neural network and we said that the ANNs or the artificial neural networks well, they don't really, I mean, they haven't been really successful in uh, mimicking the well, the way the biological learning systems work. But we said that um, there are two types of research going on. One type is focusing on how can we uh, make these ANNs as similar as possible to the BLS systems. And the other trend of research in computer science uh, is just focusing on developing more sophisticated and better um, ANNs to to do more you know six more complicated and sophisticated tasks right so today we're going to talk about the the building block of a artificial neural network that is called a perceptron yeah so here's the shape of a, of a perceptron but don't mind the math the weird shapes those circles sigmas and everything first foremost if I want to explain a perceptron to you, imagine that you've got a big training set, yeah? And you have two types of class um, in your training set, say the positive class and a negative class, right? And you've got, uh, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 training samples, right? Now, every one of these training samples is a vector of values. Right? For example, every data sample could be a vector of um, some scalar values. One is related to humidity, the other one, the other one is temperature, the other, the other one is <coughs> the amount of sunlight on the day, uh, and all these sort of values, right? So that would be one vector, one training data. And you've got many of them in your training set, right? But what you are interested is to develop a binary classifier meaning that if you give that classifier a vector value of a typical day let's say a day that is uh, has a certain level of humidity temperature sunlight and you'd like your binary classifier to tell you whether that data instance belongs to a to class number one or class number two right so if I told you that I have this interesting neural network that can do this for you, it means that given the data, it will tell you whether it's positive or negative, whether it belongs, belongs to class one or class two, for example, right? <clears throat> the building block of an artificial neural network that can actually do something like this for you is called a perceptron. This is the simplest type of a neural network that you would ever see anywhere okay now if you look at here um, a type of artificial neural network that is based on a unit called perceptron okay and there is a rule about the inputs and and the outputs of a perceptron the input is a vector of real value data okay so if i want to show the input in this example for you if you consider x Let's say x i, or I don't want to keep playing with the indices. Let's say x is one training example, right? So x is actually a vector of values, right? You have x1, x2, all the way to x n. So how many dimensions? Does your input space have? Uh, does your training data have? The answer is n dimensions. And that is why in this shape, in this figure, you see over here x1, x2, all the way to xn, right? So this guy right here is nothing but the input layer that we talked about in the previous class, the input layer. Yeah, and you have n 
uh, well, space holders over there that are just waiting for the input data to, to come in, right? <clears throat> and if you look at it, I know you're thinking about that x0 equal to 1 over there, but just ignore it for now. I'll explain to you. That's actually a very important part. Now, what's happening here is that, given an input data, we have these guys. The weights that I told you about, right? So the way it's working is that you will have, let me also put the weights over here, maybe... Maybe, let's just use the same color. So your W, you have W1, W2, all the way to Wn, right? So a linear combination of the input or the input features, remember x1, x2, xn, these are the features of your training data, is this way of combining it. W1 multiplied by x1 plus W2 multiplied by x2 plus all the way to Wn multiplied by xn. Right? So when you do all this, you reach to this point. This point over here. Yeah, let's call that point Z. Yeah, also let me show it over here. Let's call this Z, right? Now this Z has the aggregate information, which is a linear combination of the features in one training example in your data. Now what's the next step? It reaches to this point. Remember, Z is, is it a vector, is it a matrix? No, it's actually a scalar. Why is that? Because W1, W2, each one of them are scalars. X1, X2, they're also scalar values. So when you multiply these one by one and you sum them up, you, you get to one particular value, right? What is this guy over here? So we said that, uh, that this weird circle thing over here is nothing by, but sum. That sigma is just a sum. What is this guy over here? It's called the stepping function. The step function, if you remember, is a function that if its input is more than zero, the output of the step function is one. But if the input is less than zero, the output of the step function is minus one. Okay, so it is nothing but a fancy way of generating one or minus one as the output of our perceptron. So at this point, we will get either one or minus one, depending on whether z or the value that your percept that your uh, step function is getting is bigger or smaller than zero yeah <clears throat> so all of this i talked about all of this but i ignored one particular thing over here and it is that let me just erase this for a sec because it just looks a big mess over here i ignored one particular thing so we are doing the linear combination of all the features in, in our input data yeah but we ignored one particular component here and that is this uh, x0 and this w0 yeah this is actually called a bias unit this guy over here so we have no x0 in our features but we put it there and the value is always one and there's a reason why we do that remember that this w0 it still has to be learned okay but why do we even bother with having W0? Why do we even care about that? Remember, that makes our model very flexible. That makes that linear combination very flexible. To understand why, if you think about the equation of a line, yeah? So a line is y equals um, ax plus b, if you remember, right? And a, we said that, 
is the slope of the line, right? And we said that B is called the intercept. That B controls how high or how low that line could be, right? And if, if you think about it, if you don't have that B, that constant B, if you don't have it, what happens? Let's say we don't have any control over how high or how low that line is in your space. And if I ask you how, how flexible are you in generating that line, you can only say the only thing I can play with is A, the slope. So given a line, you can only control the slope and you can't play with where that line should be and that is the flexibility that you get with B over there right now if you think about our perceptron over here and how does that this idea of intercept would come over here that is something that I'm gonna talk to you about in the in the next video but for now consider it that it is important for us to have that W zero okay and if you think about it, if I want to model, uh, like mathematically express what we just talked about, the linear combination of all the features in your data, including that x0, would be w0 multiplied by x0 plus w1 multiplied by um, x1, all the way, right? All these terms over here, right? So the linear combination of all of them, if that is positive, remember, we're, we're at this stage right now, over here, at this point. If that is positive, the output of my neural network will be plus one. But if it's negative, it is minus one, right? So this has been mathematically and nicely expressed over here, but there are easier ways that we can, uh, we can express that. Remember, this W0 over here, it's actually W0 multiplied by x0 and because x0 is 1 we have just eliminated it from the equation but if we want to really be smart about it and try to kind of compress this uh, mathematical equation to a smaller one um, and considering the fact that x0 is 1 what we can do all that summation could be summarized into one simple formula and that is this guy over here so the summation of wi xi when i goes from 0 to m we are considering the sign of that particular value if it's positive the output should be plus 1 if it's negative the output should be minus 1 so if you think about it over here what do we have we have sigma of wi xi where i goes from 0 to n where the first term is w0 multiplied by x0 and x0 is 1 so we, we we even ignore that so we just write w0 plus the next term next term next term right so the sign of this guy is important for us so can we show this perceptron this whole thing is a perceptron can we show that even more uh, even uh, smarter we can, because we are interested in the sign of this um, combination over here, what we can do is we can say that a perceptron is the sign of my uh, of my y, right? You can just call, um, or maybe I can just write. Probably it's better a better idea to instead of y we have a z over here. It makes more sense. So. The sign of z, right? So if that z is bigger than, let me put a zero z here just to be more consistent. So if that z is bigger than zero, we have plus one and otherwise minus one. So that is actually a sign function. So a perceptron is a sign function, as simple as that, okay? So what does learning a perceptron mean? Learning a perceptron means learning the weights. So how can I remember I know which examples in my training set are positive and which one of them are negative. 
But how can I choose those weights W0 to Wn in a way that this perceptron would generate plus one for all the positive classes, uh, positive class samples, and minus one for all the negative or the cl uh, negative class samples. How can I learn those ways the right way that would make this perceptron intelligent for my data set so that it can classify the data in the right way? And remember that uh, these weights are in our hypothesis space. You want to find, search for these optimal weights, right? And remember that if we have n dimensions in our training data, our weights would be of n plus one dimension. And why do we have that extra dimension? As you might have guessed, we've got it over here. Okay, because of the W zero. Okay. Now um, I will explain to you in more detail why do we have this linear combination of the input features and uh, why, what does it mean to actually squash the input to a step function between one and minus one. And I will show you exactly in two dimension and, and in one dimension, what does that linear combination mean? And what does that squashing function exactly do to our, um, to our, comp to our linear combination? But this was just a big picture for now. Okay, I hope that um, you've understood the big picture about the perceptron, but just to summarize it, a perceptron is nothing but a step function, right? And the goal is to learn the weights in our perceptron in a way that, given an input data, it would generate plus one if that input data uh, is um, like belongs to class one, for example, and if that input data belongs to the other class, like say class zero, you you would like your perceptron to generate another value like minus one. So by looking at the output of your perceptron, you can understand whether your input data belongs to class one or class two. Okay because one and minus one will give you a signal as to what your perceptron thinks that input data uh, belongs to. I mean, which class does your perceptron think that that input belongs to? In the next video, we're gonna focus more into the details of a perceptron, but for now, that's it. I hope that this has been informative for you and thank you very much for watching.